business life and purpose is what my conversation with nanalal kidwai revolved around she needs no introduction from being a celebrated banker to the first woman president at fiki she has been an inspiration for many leaders including me i hope you enjoy this episode of duologues as much as i enjoyed the conversation with miss kidwai So ma'am thank you so much for joining for this conversation I am extremely thankful to you and to begin with I think the most frequently asked questions of the times how the country has dealt with the covid crisis how do you see the time ahead yeah so Manish let me start by saying I'm really honored to be on this program with you you have a great big following and I'm uh, very happy to be thank having you. this interaction with the leaders such as yourself in terms of uh, the crisis the covid crisis uh, You know, I like to see it in the buckets by which uh, different companies and industries have indeed been affected. So you get the one group that actually pivoted to change very quickly and may even have benefited mm. from the COVID crisis. Uh, pharmaceutical companies of course, uh, we have seen uh, their performance actually is even better than in uh, the pre-COVID era. Uh, we have seen uh, others like e-commerce that have sprung in uh, and fmcg companies uh, that managed to pivot uh, to a new logistics strategy also have that fared very well you get the second lot which took a little more time uh, i see that for example in companies like lafarge holsim at the global level where i sit on the board which took a beating initially because of yeah. lockdowns but very quickly sprang back to near normalcy uh, because they were able to resolve a lot of the issues and not every country shut down construction uh, they saw construction and infrastructure as a key ingredient for growth so that would be the sort of middle bucket initial suffering but jump back into a uh, reasonable performance and then there's the third which are the industries which are limping back to normalcy you know the in- and that sadly is the service sector uh, one which employs lots of people uh, restaurants hotels and that is something that does need attention because we have so many people that rely Absolutely. on uh, jobs in there or we have to help them in just reinvent themselves Absolutely. so it's a mixed bag and i think the good news is india is uh, you know coming back to normal very quickly uh, most estimates show that by march 2022 india will be back to the pre covid levels but we would have lost two years now the world has lost two years so we are not alone Absolutely. but india would have lost two years because it would have taken us two years to go back to where we were and i think we have to recognize that in those two years there are uh, many companies msmes in particular and people who will have suffered and that helping hand that the government that uh, the central bank that many individual companies have extended that helping hand must be there to support everyone to find their new normals absolutely everybody has to do their own bit yeah can't agree more so when i walk into the corridors of uh, the federation house at fiki you know one of the highlights is that you were the first woman president at fiki i think those were the years when it was something like the turning point uh, for the industry and yeah. for people to really come together yeah. to make sure that we do justice uh, to the responsibility which is given to the chambers and that is the reason that the decision making process is uh, really becoming more efficient how have you seen this journey since being the fiki president and as it is now the year i came in was actually an unusual year it was a year literally two weeks before i took over uh, that horrendous nirbhaya incident yeah. had happened in delhi and it was flashed all over the world and within a month or two of my taking over we had many presidents we had uh, prime minister cameron we had president francois hollande we had uh, just pretty much half the world arrive Absolutely. in india because it was a very important year india was regarded as a big leader in the space and one of the first questions on all their minds was inevitably surprised that there was a woman leading an industry chamber when their perception of india had been dominated somewhat by the nirbhaya uh, right. history and uh, i had to spend a little bit of time just defending uh, 
India for what it is. That yes, hideous incident, yes, there's a dark underbelly, but we also have a lot of progress as uh, women uh, exist. And that actually led me to do a book which uh, finally saw light of day a couple of years after I finished my presidentship at FIKI, which was on women CEOs. Absolutely. Because I felt as women CEOs in this country, we weren't telling our story well enough. So that, I think maybe it was good fortune that I was there at the time because I could help negate some of that very negative perception of India. The time I was there at FIKI, India was opening up to a lot of FTAs, some good, some bad, as it turns out. But there was a lot of engagement around trade and you know, the way India engaged with the rest of the world. Cool. Uh, attracting FDI, yes, but also the way we exported and Absolutely. traded. And uh, that made for a very interesting discussion. It was also something that intrinsically very interesting to me. I'd come from a global bank, the largest trade bank in the world, HSBC. Cool. And therefore, those connects were very important, particularly as India began to look east. And, you know, whether it was Malaysia, Indonesia, and of course, Japan, where we already had a strong relationship. So these countries and the way India related to them was, uh, in fact, exactly in the spaces I had worked earlier cool. by virtue of being on the Asia Pacific board of mm -hmm. HSBC. And in my role as chairman of India in terms of the way India engaged Absolutely. with those countries. But also, of course, the continuing relationship with the Western world. And uh, it was a new India. Uh, that was emerging, very confident, uh, very central to relationships with the rest of the world and actually very positive relationships. You spoke about uh, your responsibility at one of the globally leading banks. I mean, when you look at the banking sector and when I go back to the 80s when I was growing up, I do remember that one was supposed to go to a bank branch to mm. deal with the transactions to yeah. draw money or to deposit money. And then during the 90s, we saw that how banks came halfway down yeah. and ATMs started to sort of mushroom across yeah. the country and even the branches became more fragmented yeah. and more close to the customers. Like the first ATM was at HSBC. Oh, is that yeah. true? I was and not aware of it. It was oh. like this big, huge thing. Yeah, large yes. machines. Yes. Large yes. machines. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, now today, bank is on the palms of the people. I mean, yeah. they've gone digital and the access is uh, democratized, if I have yeah. to say like that. I mean, the journey has come a long way. Yeah. And I believe that the financial sector, the banking sector in specific, is one of the first sectors to embrace technology. Yeah. And we know that how banking sector has embraced technology into IoT or into artificial intelligence, blockchain in particular. Yeah. So I think a lot has happened in the last couple of decades. Yeah. How have you seen this journey being in the helm of uh, one of the global banks? Yeah. And also while we look forward to another decade or so. So at the time when I was uh, chair of HSBC, which was now five years ago, uh, the good news is that uh, HSBC's IT development, as in software development, 60% of it was happening in India. So I was uh, really, it used to be, just energized me to even visit those facilities, Absolutely. largely in Pune, Hyderabad, uh, where we had uh, these largely, you know, young people. But the software development that was happening was happening not for the Indian market, but for HSBC globally. Uh, and that continues to be a winner for many banks that uh, have those operations here. And of course, 50% of the BPO processing work was happening in India for HSBC. So India was really like a factory to HSBC globally. And uh, I was very privileged to see how that was serviced. Uh, in fact, a lot of my discussion with uh, the top teams in, across the world was to continue and grow that. Even in these last five years since I have left the bank, there has been huge evolution, particularly in the fintech space in the country. Right. And I think the big spaces where there is change right now is data and the way data analytics is driving business. And that is uh, important. Banks are going to drive that change. Public sector banks were slow adopters. Uh, the good news is when it happened, they were forced onto the same platform. So at least their systems speak to each other. And I think now as banks are being merged, I'm hoping that they will not have as difficult a time as I have seen big global banks yeah. like HSBC who did acquisitions in, elsewhere in the world. And it took ages, like five years, yeah. to try and even internet the systems. Yeah. And in those five years, a lot can go wrong. True. Uh, because True. you have two very independent banks coming True. together and the systems themselves not being right. integrated. Right. So 
I think India will lead on this and it would be a shame if we didn't. And I'm really glad to see the huge growth and of fintech in particular, uh, but of course our country's investment in terms of AI and everything to do with software development, uh, which must continue. Absolutely. Uh, and our leadership therein is key. I yeah, mean, it is. I I'll never forget how in, uh, I was in San Francisco and uh, I was chatting with a colleague of mine, actually I was going for a, a meet to uh, Silicon Valley and uh, the driver sort of stopped midway when he was hearing the conversation and uh, he gets out of the car and he says, I have to shake both of your hands. Uh, you know, that uh, for me, India, the driver says, is all about the amazing yeah. engineering IT skill set and right. such an honor to be driving you guys. Excellent. So that perception, you know, that same India when I was in business school in the 80s was an India that always had tragedy and True. poverty and floods and yeah. famine. Uh, it was now all about engineering and IT and skill. True. It was a nice change. Absolutely, to, huge. To feel and know. Yes, yeah. true. And you, you briefly touched about uh, mergers of banks. You touched very briefly about the NPAs. I mean, while there is so much of opportunity in the country and we are yet to unlock the true potential of our country and there is so much of entrepreneurship, innovation, the startups, you know, really yeah. fueling innovation and empowering the citizens of the country. The necessity is for the capital to be available, possibly at a lower cost and easy access to finance, yeah. I think, again, will play a major yeah, role. Yeah. In the backdrop of recent NPS, where it is very natural to believe that uh, the decision-making procedures will undergo larger scrutiny. Yeah. On the other hand, we see a lot of foreign funding also starting to come in the country, which is a clear reflection of the potential of the country. Yeah. How do you see this particular environment? And is there an advice uh, from you to the banks? So I worry about the NPAs in our system. I mean, it doesn't take me to say the Reserve Bank of India has said that it believes that NPAs will pop up to the 13 and a half, 14% and so on the higher side for the public sector banks. Uh, that's high. And it means that money is locked right. in unproductive uh, loans. It also means that balance sheets will need more capital in order to support those NPAs as they are worked through. Uh, the good news is that the creation of uh, the bad bank uh, or, you know, the new asset management company which can take over some of these loans is, is good news because it will enable working out these NPAs, True. some of which may well end up being productive assets. Absolutely. But the time it's taking for these resolutions, even through our IBC that was set up, uh, is too long. I read a study which said 450 days is the average time it takes for a company that goes into the IBC okay. for settlement. Right. 450 days is far too long for a company which may well be a patient on a table needing oxygen. Sure. If you give the oxygen at time, he can bounce back. Absolutely. Uh, but if you don't, that patient is dead. And I think we need to speed up that resolution in a way that works better for us. Right. Uh, so anything that helps that is good. I think opening up these ARCs, these asset reconstruction companies for foreign investment, which has all just happened now, is very positive. I think this government in its latest announcements in the budget has made some huge uh, announcements for what the financial sector needs. Uh, whether it is public sector banks, injection of capital, uh, merging, uh, yes, a couple of privatizations, yeah. those I think will be much harder to see going right. through. Uh, so that's the restructuring of the banking world. The restructuring for NPAs, which is the setting up of the asset management company, bad banks, uh, all of that is valuable. The DFI, the, right. uh, which is for the financial institution for infrastructure, is a new institution coming in, which again is a positive. Sure. And then we need to look at the entire gamut of capital market reforms, where we need a vibrant bond industry. I mean, from the days I was chairing FICI's Capital Markets Committee, yeah. which is way back now in uh, the early sort of 2000s, right. this has been a refrain. And India, I fear, is still a failure on this front. We need a vibrant bond market Absolutely. so that the banks who can fund early in the system as they do, don't end up being the True. only source of funding mm -hmm. right through. Absolutely. They have to be able to switch from being bank to being capital markets. 
so that the company can then go raise bonds and take out the banks so the banks can go on and lend to others. Uh, I'm glad to see that the venture capital equity front is getting more and more vibrant. We have a lot of Silicon Valley type of investors in India. Uh, do we need more? Absolutely. I think building this startup culture in India, and it's particularly full of people in the tech sort of a, uh, frame, a lot of engineers in there, but we need them across the board. Sure. Uh, we need them for energy efficiency. We need uh, experts in uh, e-commerce. Uh, so all of this startup uh, work needs equity funding. Right. And I think we need to look at our tax structures, mm. which are still quite frightening for people who want to come in, create an environment where investors come happily, our tax guys recognize that out of every 10 investments, nine may go wrong. And just because the one does well doesn't mean you tax that to sure, death. Right. You have to enable the culture and ecosystem for startups and startup financing to build. Mm. And I also would love to see uh, where our fund managers, and I have seen that a lot of people who are managing money in India prefer to work out of Singapore. And it isn't because they love Singapore. Right. They could easily work from India, Absolutely. despite our poor environment and air and all of that, right. if our tax structures were more enabling. Absolutely. So let's look at what it takes for attracting these very highly paid individuals Absolutely. to set up their teams in India so that mm. we in India can benefit from the tax that they pay True. rather than them managing this money from abroad. Absolutely. And we also hear that uh, there are conversations for the necessity of public banks to go private. I mean, is there advice would you like to give to people who are wanting to acquire licenses yeah. uh, to run the banks in the time to come? Well, look, we need more banks. We need bigger banks. And it's not easy for existing banks to just grow uh, on their own. So we do need a much more vibrant and a larger banking system. So growth on the one side and a few new players would be extremely helpful. The, the logical ones for the new licenses should be the NBFCs. Non-banking finance companies are essentially in the business of banking. Right. And for those that want to convert, not all of them want to convert, many of them started because there were gaps in the banking system and they filled a very important role. Some of them ended up stuck with a lot of bad loans. Uh, and they may never recover, but there are many that are very good in there. And enabling them to move onto banking platforms, giving them the license, has two advantages. One is it helps them grow now with public deposits, so they're able to grow faster and grow in a way that they are more cost-effective. Right. And on the other, uh, what it does is it brings them under much stricter vigilance of the Reserve Bank of India, so it makes the compliance regime uh, better as well. Right. So those would be the first and logical move. The jury is out on whether industry should be permitted to come in or not. But let's face it, I mean, two of our largest groups, Tata and Birla, are already in financial services, Bajaj yes. also. Uh, so they are offering different types of financial Absolutely. services. So why not enable them with the right safeguards and governance structures to use their skill sets and their existing presence in through NBFCs into also having the banking license. So I don't think we should be afraid. Uh, we are right to say we don't want the nexus, but we shouldn't be afraid. And at least for those that have already shown their metal, uh, not necessarily those that still haven't shown that they can manage financial services, but those that have uh, should certainly be given the chance. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I think that was quite insightful. And now is the time to move to the part which would be very inspiring for people. Ma'am, you spoke about uh, what success may mean to people and you were the first Indian women to be at the Harvard Business School and I was hearing one of your talks where you specifically articulated the journey during those days and how you sort of uh, braved against many odds so to say and uh, you know tell us something about that part of your life. I had set my heart on an MBA in the US and uh, Yes, there was resistance. Uh, there was resistance uh, because it was seen as very far, which I guess it was those days. Uh, there were no direct flights. They were very costly. It was almost a given that once I went, there was no coming back till the degree was done, not the way kids fly back and forth these days. And then, of course, I came from a very uh, 
uh, dare I say, traditional North Indian family, uh, aside from my parents, who were extremely progressive, fortunately, but you know, the sort of wider lot of uncles and aunts who uh, would prevail and say, uh, oh, you should just get her married. And right. there's no question of, you know, why are you wasting your money? And why are you, you know, she's, this is just not worth it. And the good news is that I actually think because there were these naysayers, uh, the uncles and others uh, who would get me furious, I might add, <laughs> because it was none of their business in the first place, uh, that it just strengthened my resolve. So when I look back, I'm really glad I had these sort of guys because they strengthened my resolve to apply, but also strengthened my resolve to prove them wrong. True. That I was going to do well there, I was going to come back and use it, I was going to show them that it was absolutely incorrect of them to have believed that it was going to be a waste of money. And uh, so I often say this actually, that for all the times that you have people around you who don't believe in you, it can give you a wonderful energy yeah. to make a positive out of it, even Absolutely. though it really gets you cross at the time. Yeah. Absolutely. So rather than let it get you down, fight it back. Sure. Yeah. And you've quoted uh, Winston Churchill mentioning that success is going from failure to failure with enthusiasm. Sometimes you may find it difficult to bounce back in life. What was that which was fueling that passion or, you know, that enthusiasm to bounce back and ensure that you learn from your experiences or failures, so to say, and then create success in this whole process? You know, I think I was very fortunate in uh, having a, a, a mentor in my father who came from the world of business. He was CEO of an insurance company, so he understood the space. And very early, he had, in fact, instilled in me this that, look, you are not going to succeed all the time. You have to have a thick skin uh, in anything you do because you will fail. Absolutely. Uh, and I was also very conscious of the fact that being sort of often the only woman in the workplace, that I had more of a glare of lights on me than anyone should. I True. felt every failure was not only magnified for me, but for all womankind, maybe I carried more of a burden than I should have, but I yeah. felt that way, True. a bit like a goldfish in a bowl. True. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, failure was never easy to accept and recognize, but it was a given. And I think the knowledge that every failure is not the end, that every failure brings a lesson, and that there's a light at the end of the tunnel is important. But I think it's very easy for me to say this, because you know, when it's sort of in you and you're in that situation, how do you get yourself out of it? And I think that's where the balance becomes important. If everything you do is about your work, you are going to get down. So in those moments where you are down and out at work, you have to have a support system. So in my case, it was my family that made me feel good, that gave me that reprieve, or it could be hobbies. Some, in my case, it would have been, you know, things like the Capital Markets Committee at FIKI, where I went with uh, all the desire to learn what was happening, uh, maybe even to understand what it was that I had got wrong. And to be in a space which was less threatening because it wasn't a work environment. And so those external interests, sometimes related to work, sometimes not, like my interest in music, wildlife, become very important. Absolutely. So knowing what those are, being able to lean on those to help you through those times, and it works the other way too, when things are down and out at home, to have your work uh, yeah. that can help yeah. you focus, concentrate, take some of that uh, negatives away is, is also important. You can only hope that everything doesn't go down together. But that <laughs> also happens because it's in your stars. Yeah, Absolutely. So, ma'am, in your book, uh, 30 Women in Power, you've articulated the journey and stories of uh, powerful women in India, I mean, who have accomplished yeah, great uh, women. You know, yeah, yeah, great women. Yeah. So, so any 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 specific story coming in your coming in your mind and something which really inspired you yourself while you were articulating that book? Yeah. So look, I mean, every one of those women was awe inspiring. I was very struck by how many had a father who was the support factor through it. So, I tell this to a lot of young fathers that the role you play in shaping your daughter's lives, not just you know, your son, but your children, your daughter's life is very critical because every one of these women, and it may have primarily been because at that stage it was the fathers who were the working members. Uh, they relied, of course, all of us women relied on our mothers for the strength they gave mm -hmm. us. 
But the father's role in choice of careers, support therein was, was really critical and that, that comes through a lot. Uh, I think for women themselves, uh, all of them talk about her ambition, how ambition was not bad and how they managed that, having an ambition, uh, but maybe not showing it in an environment which did not accept women as being ambitious was seen as bad. But being able to manage that ambitious as a, ambition as a positive energy True. was very, very important. Uh, integrity and humility, these were other factors which emerged. Uh, every one of these women worked in some way with local communities or were deeply engaged with the CSR work of their companies. And the humility, I think, comes through in two ways. One is the humility to accept that you don't know everything. Yeah. So you, the general view is that women make good team players. And I think as CEOs, that advantage comes in as you build around you with people who bring skill sets you don't have. So the first thing is to recognize the skill set you don't have. I always quote this uh, uh, Sanskrit shloka, Mahastavira Sangarakshita. To know what we do not know is the beginning of wisdom. Absolutely. So I can't be everything. So let me have around me the best in the fields that I don't know. True. So then you create the team. So all these women talked about how the team was critical for them and the humility of recognizing that we do not know everything. So we must continuously learn on the one hand and on the other build our teams in a way that we can fill for the gaps that we have in our own information and experience. This is so relatable actually and very assuring because uh, you know recently we started a program called Catalyst in our organization and this program essentially is about defining the characters of all of us who come together at Panasonic. And somewhere it was in the backdrop of my own experiences when we were sort of designing this program. And there are three important attributes which define an individual who works with our company. And that is what we aspire to be. And when I look back in my own professional journey so far, so I think the initial part was about carrying ambition for myself. And then subsequently when, you know, one faces a variety of situations, yeah. so one becomes more resilient. Yeah. So ambition, resilience, and then finally, I believe humility. Yeah. So these are important attributes Traits. which define yeah. being a catalyst working with our organization. Yeah. So this is very assuring and you know really relatable yeah. what you just and mentioned. And quite timeless. I mean, if you look at timeless. The, the traits, and I was uh, part of a Harvard Business School discussion, which over the COVID period now is showing that the leadership skill sets that are emerging as important are resilience and agility. Absolutely. So, you know, exactly to your yeah. point. And the second is about collaboration, yeah. uh, our ability to work with others and empowerment. Right. And the empowerment one is so important because when I think about the, some of the trickiest situations I was in as CEO, uh, when uh, I had 32 people locked up in the hotels in Bombay, in the Obro and the Taj, when right. the terrorist attack happened. Yeah. And I was totally out of my depth. I mean, how am I going to be responsible for 32 people's lives? and giving them advice on whether they should make a run for it or stay True. Uh, is, I yeah. mean, this is, it's scary. Yes. So that's where you build the team around you. The empowerment you have is in terms of those that are on the ground. True. The team, the person from my team who's standing outside the Oberoi True. and, you know, give, let him or her decide, decide. Uh, based on consultation with police and True. others who we had True. obviously assembled as uh, folks that could advise us. And likewise, through the floods in Bombay, True. I lost connection with all my Mumbai branches because the entire telecom system in Mumbai went down because their servers went down, because the power system went down because of the flooding. And suddenly you have branches with young people, you know, your, see your branch manager is a 30-year-old. They're sitting in branches. They don't know where, in pitch darkness whether they should go or stay. And... Each one has to decide for themselves what they do. Some of them spent the night in the branch sitting on tables in darkness. Imagine True. what that's like. True. Uh, with no connect with the rest of the world, watching the water coming up and not knowing uh, what, will happen, what will happen next. Others managed to get to buildings near, nearby. Yeah, uh, and it was amazing to see how people helped. Absolutely. And all of them crashed in someone's flat or some True. place that was organized. But they took the decisions. Right. Because there was no one to tell them what to do. Absolutely. And we saw the same thing happen in the Taj. 
somewhere along the line, you leave people to rise to a challenge. You Absolutely. empower them. They do, and COVID is about that. It's about local decision making. Yes. So you push that decision making out, but make sure that the people who are taking those decisions are empowered and well trained Absolutely. to take the right decisions. And then you have to stand by those decisions too. Yes, that is true actually, and this brings uh, again very reassuring because the last twelve years. Uh, the three pillars based on which we are creating the culture in our organization are again very very similar and we defined them in 2008 and again those are first one is localization and not necessarily it means for a multinational company to have local people taking those decisions or running those businesses not necessarily that yeah. but localizing everything what we do the processes the procedures the decision making yeah. procedures the products itself customized yeah. to the local needs for a japanese company for a global company yeah. Yeah, where potentially the platforms are designed considering the global requirements yeah, that's in mind huge. And second, so first is localization and the second one is very similar to what you mentioned, empowerment. Yeah. How do you ensure that you empower people? So there is a process called Gemba process in Japanese, which essentially means that let the people at the place where the action is take yeah. the decisions. Yeah. And third is rich communication, that how important is it to ensure yeah. that the communication is very efficient. Yeah. And these are the three pillars based on which yeah. we have created the culture at Panasonic I mean, India. It sounds like you're absolutely on the right track. That's Thank you so great. much, ma'am. Yeah. This brings to me my next question. So we all know that how you've involved yourselves into activities, into uh, uh, the social uh, entrepreneurship or the social responsibility which you are leading in the area of sanitization, waste management, sustainability. So please share with us your experiences into those initiatives of yours and how do you see yourselves you know taking those forward yeah it's very hard to live in these times uh, and in india and ignore what is happening around us so right. whether it's to do with environment where you know we have to live with pollution it impacts us every day uh, degrading of our forests uh, the whole issue around energy efficiency this impacts and water, which yeah. is such a key area, Absolutely. are such key ingredients of our day-to-day -day life that we can't really ignore, ignore it. Them. Yes. And uh, so I would just say that I was very fortunate that in my time at HSBC, the bank had uh, decided it would work in the climate change space. Hmm. And I was part of that global team that worked in that area. So I learned, I mean, I'm no expert on energy efficiency, but I learned at a global level about what carbon capture, energy efficiency was about, and also therefore took me into water. And right. I'd like to believe that I was part of the renovation of the climate change messaging at the bank to water, because it was just not enough to talk about glacial met True. to people. I mean, you know, they yeah. were like, so what has that got to do with me? But Absolutely. the minute you talk to them about water, which of course suffers from issues to do, with your glaciers melting and you begin to recognize how key water is, you can connect the dots back to climate change. True. And today, whether it is floods that ravage us, uh, because we have seen only recently in Uttarakhand what happens yeah. when a glacier breaks off, or on the other shortage of water, uh, these are key areas uh, for us. So soon after my retirement, I started the India Sanitation Coalition with a view to working on sanitation it has linkages with water but it's really more Absolutely. to do with treatment and uh, provision of uh, toilets for people and I, I could not have chosen a better time to enter that space because six months later we had <clears throat> prime minister modi from the ramparts of the red fort announced the swachh bharat mission oh. and uh, lo and behold the thing which i thought would be the hardest which was to convince the government that there was it's due importance to be given to this area, uh, it suddenly became an open door. Dealing with government was an absolute delight. It's been gratifying and I can only say that for every one of us who lives in this country, we cannot ignore what happens around us. So pick an area that is a passion and work in it because you can bring that energy and discipline that the corporate world teaches you, put it to work in some way. Very inspiring. I'm sure this is going to inspire a lot of people like me to find their own way forward to do our own bit. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. Admiring you for last many years. When I look at you, I think my reflections are that I see you as somebody who carries controlled aggression, very composed, 
I mean, how are you able to reflect that kind of composure? Because the situations <laughs> you deal with uh, can yeah. be very demanding and you know, there must be so much happening otherwise in the backdrop. Yeah. How do you maintain that composure? Well, maybe it's just a front because I'm sure there are people who've been at the receiving end of that aggression. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think, you know, I don't see myself as overtly aggressive person. Uh, I think I like to believe that I prefer to carry people with me. Yes. I accept that there are people who, for whom I am a cup of the right cup of tea and for those that don't. Right. So that's fine too. Uh, you know, I can walk away from a situation if there's someone who just thinks differently. Uh, I don't think being overly aggressive helps because, you know, you're not going to be yeah. able to convert someone who's not thinking your way. So you can try. True. Uh, so I would rather work in a more constructive way. And then it's not for me as a challenge to sort of overtly take them on, but a challenge for me to prove that person wrong over time. Absolutely. And I think that's a form of aggression. Yes. It's like, I'm not going to take this lying down. I'll show you. But it doesn't have to be by... By impulse. By, yeah. Or, yeah. you know, just... Uh, uh, my father used to always say that uh, uh, if you stick a nail into a tiger, uh, what is it going to do? it's going to bite your head off, right? <laughs> so why do you want to be the person who sticks yeah. a nail into a tiger? You'd True. be better off recognizing that there are other ways of dealing with that issue. Absolutely. Hmm. This possibly brings me to the last uh, question of the conversation, but most important one. I mean, is there a higher purpose which lets you do what you do? I mean, what is that which wakes you up every morning? And is there something which you are wanting to really you know, create for the world or some higher purpose which drives yeah. the energy in you? You know, I'd love to say that I want to change the world and sort things out. I think the one thing that drives me is uh, the environment. It's, uh, I enjoy wildlife, uh, I love nature. Uh, and for me to see how we destroy it around us, but also to revel in what I see when I go into the parks, there are young people, young women, you know, whole safari jeeps of young women who are out there not just looking for the tiger but enjoying the forest Absolutely. for what it is. Something is changing. I think our younger people are rediscovering the beauty that is our country. Uh, I see it whether it's the trekking in the mountains or even just those that drift to Goa and the beach, uh, that there is, I think, a seeking of uh, what nature is for us, True. which is a balm. And it came back to us through uh, the lockdown as well. I think many people began to discover birds yes. on their balcony, yes. the sounds. The f and I, if we can capture this and preserve what is so rich in India, our fauna, our wildlife, our trees, uh, how important that would be. And through that and for that, we need our forests, we need water, uh, forests give us water. So those sort of interlinkages, uh, let's not destroy what we have, are all part of, I think, uh, a passion, which yes. I will always continue to work in. It's a huge area. I'm enough of an environmentalist without being an activist because I'm also pro-growth and pro-industry. Absolutely. So how do you marry both? Yes. Because for every mining activity you do and forest you destroy, you also need those jobs and you might need that activity to grow industry. True. So these are the balancing acts which are not easy to resolve, but I'm quite uh, happy to be part of those debates Absolutely. because for me, both are important. A vibrant economy with jobs and conserving and preserving the environment. So I would say maybe that uh, if it's a passion, uh, but ultimately it's about uh, be enjoying what one does. So absolutely, it uh, can be lots of big and little things that keep on going. So any message for the youth which is watching this video? I think it's so important that every one of us gives back to society that engages in some way with the communities that we serve, whether at work or at home. And you find it in some way, not just because it gratifies who you are, and what you think of for yourself, but also because it helps so many others out there. And there are so many little things we can do that can make a huge difference out there. 
and thank you so much it was not only insightful and inspiring for me but i'm sure everybody is going to really learn a lot out of this conversation i'm extremely thankful to you for hosting me here and uh, looking forward to see you again yeah. thank you so much yeah thank you thank you so much manish really enjoyed the interaction thank you thank you